Okay, so apparently I am going to be mixing this in front of you. Oh, I want to start with a few questions from you all as to what you are expecting. Firstly, how many of you are engineers? How many of you are music producers? And how many of you are assisting music producers? Okay. So, we will take it from the beginning. I want to say a few words first about before we actually start doing any mixing. You've come here to see me mix, but actually most of the mix begins when you are tracking the song. So engineers should know this, that intuitively as a producer or as an engineer, all of you are producing and all of you are mixing at any given moment. Even whilst you are composing and you are producing and you are adding tracks to whatever you are composing, you are mixing. And even when an engineer does something like reamp a guitar, change the sound of the drums, change the reverb on the voice, changes processing, none of it is something that the composer heard in his head. So in a way, an engineer also produces a mix. And I think that is a very important thing if you want to understand mixing. I don't consider myself as a mixing engineer. I consider myself as someone who is producing a mix. It is a performance. It is possibly as equally important as the musicians and the production is. There is one level of production where you are producing music to put it together and there is another level of production where the engineer produces it further to get something. Sometimes not always, sometimes it is very different from what the original producer of the music envisioned. Sometimes it is not. Often it can end up with a happy ending either way. The producer will say, oh I didn't see it that way, uh, but I like it. It is completely different from what we thought it should be. Or they will say, no it is shit, we want the shoot mix. I am sure all of you have gone through the, it is shit, we want the shoot mix. Which leads me to another important thing, before engineers get their hands on your session, producers are producing it. And when you are producing it, there are, there are two functions of this. One is, whatever you produce, when it leaves you, whether it is your shoot mix, or whether it is your, I want to present this to the director, or producer, or Salman Khan, whoever it might be. Yeah, that mix that you are presenting, very often ends up being the reference template for the mix that we have to then replicate. Then there is no creativity involved. It's just make it loud. So the first thing I want to talk to you all as producers, as music producers, is that you are innately mixing it. I would request, I mean if we started a trend where you guys give a mix or a shoot mix without master bus processing. Yeah, I know everyone has Waves L3 and I know you can get 20 dB additional gain and everything sounds good when it's loud. But please make it a habit to start giving shoot mixes without master bus compression because that sets up a preconcept notion that this is how the song should sound. Whereupon I don't think then there's any point in really giving it to be mixed to a mixing engineer. I'm sure there are many mixing engineers who will, maybe if this video is being recorded, spit on this idea because there's a hell of a lot less work. But there's no point, there's no point actually doing any mixing if you are just going to slam the shit out of it with a limiter at the end of it. You may as well just put all the faders up at zero, put the limiter on and say, yeah, here it is, it's done. So that's from the music production side of thing. Because at the end of it, today, um, none of the stuff that you are working on generally makes it now to CD. Everything is digital download, whether it's Spotify or Apple Music or whatever, Amazon Music or whatever. And all these, or YouTube too, very important. And all these services have now a loudness limit. So what happens is, you may be squashing the mix as an engineer or as a producer, whether it is for shoot or to impress the hell out of someone in the studio or it's a shoot mix or it's a presentation mix, you will probably find that if you don't follow loudness curves, 
your mix is just getting locked off when you actually put it on YouTube or any of the other online streaming platforms because all of them have a loudness limit. All of them will limit your mix further. So it's very important for you guys to maintain dynamics. Yeah, there is no number of tests and studies that have shown that people prefer to listen to music with dynamics. One of the reasons why vinyl is getting such a resurgence is, well, there are two reasons. One is right now a whole generation of people who've grown up without really listening to music on a quality system using a CD player have suddenly discovered vinyl because they've grown up with MP3s. I actually read an article a couple of months back in The New Yorker, which is a respected magazine titled Why CDs may actually sound better than LPs. Yep, we knew that in 1984. They did. And they still do. But we have a generation who's grown up without any CDs quality sound. You've grown up with MP3s. For you, vinyl suddenly sounds better. Why does vinyl sound better? Because there's a physical limitation on how much signal to noise a vinyl CD, a uh, vinyl record can handle. And because of that, you have to keep dynamics if you want to print it to an LP. And that's the reason why. Now, I have a lot of friends abroad who are working together with loudness platforms and loudness systems to spread awareness. And so I wanted to start the workshop with this thing about loudness. Loud is not necessarily good. I'd suggest if you want to play it loud, do what any consumer would do if you like the music. Turn up your volume. Don't turn up your limiters, compressors on the master bus. Crank your monitors up if you want to play it loud. You'll have two advantages. It will sound much better, trust me. And it will also translate better. Now, the next step after you've done your shoot mix, <laughs> assuming you've got a nice dynamic mix without any master bus processing going, yeah? The next thing is, you're going to be passing this on as a session to an engineer. Hopefully to mix, whether it is in-house, whether it's your assistant, whether it's an outside engineer to a studio, wherever. Now, what happens, what happens is, at this point, what you have finished playing back to the producer, finished playing back to your director, star, whoever, whoever's making that final call on, yeah, man, this is it. Abhi, ye to super hit hone wale. Yeah? It's important to immediately first print one reference copy of what you've just heard. Okay? Because that's the guide that is going to help the engineer figure out what it is that you wanted. Secondly, it is very important to start giving out stems of your work with or without processing as per whatever your agreement with your engineer is at those levels. If something is clipping, when you keep it individually, please group all your faders together except the auxes. Trim everything down. Leave 5-6 dB headroom on the master fader and dump it like that. Now what happens when you do something like that is it makes the engineer's job that much easier. If I get a session from certain people, I know <coughs> that if I just put all the faders up at 0 dB, that is a very correct representation of what that person was intending for the mix. That is my reference mix. I don't need a separate reference. Yeah, so I don't need to start guessing what the song should sound like. And apparently there are now filmy engineers who mix two and three songs a day. So I'm sure this will be very helpful. Because when I get a song, I normally spend close to a day just listening to it with faders up, without touching it at all. I may be on Facebook, I may be on my iPad, I may be reading something, I may be drinking whiskey, but it's on a loop, running on and on and on and on. I'm not actively looking at anything. I'm not actively saying, hey, I should EQ that, hey, I should compress that. But I am learning the song. By the time I start mixing the song, I should know the song. And... This is old school stuff because if you've tracked the song or a commercial for that matter, if you spend nine hours 
seeing a 30 second commercial being put together over your speaker, you should be mixing it in your head by then. You're learning the thing as it's building up, the same way as the music producer is doing it. So, by then, it shouldn't take you eight hours to recreate the mix. Yeah? So, that's one thing in terms of, and I'm very glad there are so many music producers here. And if you all have assistants who do these transfers and dumps for you, this message should be spread to them too. Okay? Any questions? Everyone with me? One small question. You said that uh, when we keep all the tracks on Louder. when we keep all the tracks on Unity, we should get the idea of what the, the music producer is. Doing. That's probably the scratch. Okay. But so many times, uh, it's recorded so many, live. Yeah, elements yes. recorded yes. live and which are not balanced right, unfortunately. Correct. So, I am speaking generally, uh, well, the way I am used to working is that music producer generally will take the stems from okay. your Pro Tools live recording, okay. do more production on Logic so, or Cubase so or whatever, and then post recording, he puts out that okay. stuff. <laughs> now, unfortunately, it's a different matter when part of it is live, part of it is programmed and maybe it goes to two, three other studios, then it's Khichri and it's like free for all. But, 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 again, okay, thank you, very important yeah, thing. I asked this question because probably... Yeah, probably so, might think. again, I don't know why I'm holding this up as a mic. Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> again, again, what happens, what happens in a situation like this is, the moment you get, the moment you get a Pro Tools session that is like that, or whatever, Logic session, Pro Tools session, Cubase session, whatever it is that you work with, the first thing you should do is listen to it the way it is. Which is now so easy because whatever the monitoring path you are using, it will play through that. And immediately do a bounce of that. I've seen, I've seen, an, uh, this was actually told to me by a very top Hollywood mixer that mixing engineers for film, for the final mix, tended to get stuff from the edit stage and wipe out automation. And actually, there is a huge amount of useful automation that is done by the video editor on your tracks. So, when you get like a film reel, half the dialogue work and its stuff is already done for you by someone else, it then it becomes like a matter of ego, get, no, it's, it's my thing. In the early days when we didn't have good quality samples, good quality recordings, yes, engineers used to do that. Give me everything separate. Give me everything without reverb. Give me everything without delay. Now, what happens, what happens for an engineer when you're trying to do it? Me, for example, I have a huge problem replicating delays from logic. There is a certain sound to the way a delay sounds in Logic as a program that you just cannot replicate in Pro Tools. Trust me, I've tried for I think 15 years, not managed yet. And also, if you're particular, you can have a chat with your engineer. Engineer can have a chat with you, say, okay, you have this reverb, give it to me separately. I can choose whether I want to add it to the mix, I want to augment it with something, I want to replace it with something, anything. But that gives him a freedom. All too often I find music producers use expensive tasty reverbs and delays and then give one stereo bounce with everything's delay sent club together. That's pointless. I may not want to listen to the delay, I mean I may think that the delay on your snare is smearing everything else and you mix the voice delay, which is beautiful, with that delay, and everything has come. Keep things separate as far as possible. Now, again, there's a caveat here because a lot of you who are senior producers have a flunky or an assistant where you finish the thing, whoever bhai has approved it, somebody has approved it, you've said, okay, thank you, Tata, you go leave the studio, and that guy's dumping the tracks. Now, I have received a lot of sessions with over 200 tracks because the assistant has decided to either use auto bounce because he's lazy. Okay, auto bounce is great for you guys, but it's terrible for people who are actually doing the session for mixing. Or he's just given 16 tracks. Now, again, what happens? 
very often you guys may layer samples as producers, layer guitar samples, layer drum samples. Now, whatever balance you have layered your samples at is what should be given. If I receive a session with nine kick drums, nine kick drum tracks, I have no idea. I mean, I could spend the next three weeks trying to guess what is the balance of those nine kicks between themselves. You have an idea because you use, okay, this kick has a middle, nice middle, this one has a little top end click, this one has a little tubby bottom, and I put them all together and they sound big. And if you put one soft big gym under that, it really sound huge. But I don't know that. You send me the session, even with just four kicks, I have no idea what the balance is. Either you are dumping it, you should dump it as kick with that balance, or snare when you use nine different snares with that balance. Recording and uh, mixing engineers are not masochists. We would rather spend time being creative with what you've given us than playing Jharuwala, cleaning up tracks, trying to identify tracks named audio 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Or then, of course, there's the enthusiastic guy who will type guitars dash logic dash path name dash BP, B, what, bounce in place BIP, not BIP. dot BIP. Call it guitar one, guitar two, guitar three. Yeah. So these are things that you all can do that not only make the engineering part of it later on easy, but it benefits you tremendously because there's no back and forth on the mix. Hey, yaar, ye, I've given you nine tracks of Dholux, but you know, that bhai had played that with the chapki harder. Those were the main ones that I wanted. Can we please rebalance it? How much time is then wasted? Studio time, your time, with maybe a package deal, but everyone's time is wasted going back and forth. And very often then, somebody decides that, no, we are going to release the movie this Friday, we want the master now. Happened to me. I mix one song and they want the master now. Rough mixes go out with an L1 limiter on it, and that's it. When money and business combine, neither you nor I nor anyone is going to wait for you all to do this. So, you all are the first primary mixers of the track. As producers, you all are mixing the track as you're building it up. It's stupid to have to pass it on. It's like you've created something fancy with a Lego set and then you break everything down and give it to the engineer saying, Abhi wo bana. Uh. It's stupid, right? So, you guys have to now start working in a way that is collaborative and makes it easier for the engineer. Easier as in to be more creative, not to be like a sausage factory. To be more creative with your work and take it further. Any questions? Anyone else? Okay, so getting back to what Viju said. First thing, you get a Pro Tools session or whatever session as an engineer now, yeah? First thing you should do is not strip the automation and just see what they've done. Chances are high, probably you might not have all the plugins. Okay? But don't strip it completely of all the things that you don't have. First, sit down and hear it. Understand what it's about. Yeah, because today it's very rare. Biju is one case where he's lucky he gets to track most of the stuff that he mixes. Not the case for me. I almost never track anything I mix. At least, not in the film world. So, that's it from the production side of things. No one has any questions? At what, what stage should uh, mixing automation usually be done? The best uh, stage for There is no best stage or right stage. You are an engineer or you are a music director? Music producer? No, which one are you? You are an engineer. Well, then that's in your hands as for how you feel whilst you are mixing. Everyone has different ways, but I would assume that logically 
until you have all your faders up and you've done your whatever basic EQ and compression and whatever you want to do. That's the point where you start automating it. Every mix starts as a static mix. For producers, of course, you can be automating anything at any time. Make sure you write it down and keep it. Producers do a lot of automation. For example, when I work with Clinton, he is so fussy about his vocal automation that he will sit on Pro Tools and do the vocal automation for me. Say, this is the way I want. Not because I can't do it, but it's just simply easier for him to do it for me than tell me how he wants it. How do you deal with plugin conflicts? You just said, you know, you may not have all the plugins that a producer may have. Uh, I don't get a session generally with plugins unless it's a good <coughs> session which is recorded. And by and large, I would assume that I have the choice to remove the plugins. Very often when we are tracking, singer says, hey, I want a nice reverb and delay. Some singers may say, no, I don't want any feedback. I want it dry in my ear. But the monitoring, you're monitoring with a reverb and delay plugin. It's there. It's being left there. It feels nice. It feels good in the rough mix of the song, rough balance. You keep it there. You don't have the plugin. I may have to explain myself better. Uh, okay. I track, I program on uh, Ableton and uh, Cubase, but I track my live acoustic instrument, whatever I record, into Pro Tools directly. So I have a Pro Tools session ready, and I've been fiddling with it as a producer to, uh, you know, <coughs> make it sound the way I'd like it to sound. But eventually, when that session goes out, and there may have been uh, points where you know. Uh, uh, the other the, the, the mix engineer I'm sending it to may not have the plugins I have used in, in what version of Pro Tools are you using? The latest one, 12.8 uh, point whatever. This I keep updating it as a minute. Oh. So, so, best thing for you to do is freeze your tracks. Why don't you use that? I mean, there's, there's now so much power in Pro Tools, it's more powerful than anything else out there. Right. Freeze your tracks, bounce them with your automation and your plugins. I mean, it, it is. Can keep the options also so that you can keep the track alive with the plugin. Right. If it doesn't have that, you can have the process track. The process alive, right? Okay. Keep an activated. Right. That's what it again, does, right? Sorry? The freezing does the same thing, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, means it, even if no, you but there are, there are. You can simply bounce and keep that track alive with the plugin. So if the engineer has that plugin, he will open with the plugin, otherwise, he will use the process track. But there are many ways to do it in Pro Tools, actually. You can freeze the track which is basically it creates a frozen version which won't allow you to edit it. You can freeze up to a certain insert if you want. Yeah. Wow. So if you're using some fancy delay plugin from some third party plugin manufacturer that you're pretty sure your studio guy won't have, you can say freeze up to this plugin or only freeze this plugin. So the audio track will have that plugin. All the other plugins will be open. Okay. You can freeze it with the plugin, without the plugin. You can freeze it with the automation, without the automation, with pan, without pan. I mean, the amount of options you now have of how you freeze are limitless. Right. You can freeze the entire session in a matter of seconds, make a copy of it, hide and make the original tracks inactive, delete them from the session. Rename the new tracks will be called what CJM, CPM, or something like that, right? Rename them, use global track renaming, remove the CPM, and you have a copy of your session with your automation, with your levels, with your plugins, with your processing, without any plugins. You can then import it into GarageBand and play it, it will play the same way. Quotes. <laughs> Blessing and dangerous, depending on whom you're giving it to. <coughs> Any other questions on this? I don't know if I'm not getting through to you or everyone here is a genius already. <laughs> uh, what are some of the destructive processes that a music producer should, should be aware of before uh, any on the line? Anything you do is a destructive process, isn't it? There's very little an engineer can do to change it once it's in his hands. Something that would really destroy the timbre or yeah. Oh, when you say destroy the timbre, make compromises, I don't believe any music director would 
do that on purpose unless it is a sound that is intended to be. If that's a sound that is intended to be, I would much rather receive the sound distorted or whatever it is that the music director was trying to convey than have to try and figure out from a rough mix, oh, the voice is distorted. Did he mean to do that? Was it a mistake? Yeah, it can be a mistake sometimes, but quick phone call will sort that out. No? The biggest mistake you can make is recording it distorted. But in post, you can do anything you want. That can't be undone. If you record something clipped, it's gone. It's clipped forever. Anything else? So generally, you get sessions nowadays for mixing, like logic session or keyboard session. It's quite easy that you have a producer to feel maintained, hai, like you say. So sometimes this happens that music director is happy with the mix, but music producer is not because it's not according to the shoot mix or the reference mix. It's sounding good for the music director and other people. So how to decide whether the where the music producer's limits and, and its engineer's work or how to deal with this scenario? You're the engineer? I'm assisting. No, no but you're the engineer yeah. in this case, right? Yeah. Who's paying you? <laughs> My boss. No, no, who's paying you? The person whom I, uh, I'm assisting, yeah. Uh, client, uh, music director. Music director, yeah. You have to listen to what he's saying. <laughs> Until your work is reached a point of being collaborative where your input is valid as as anyone else on the team, by rule of thumb, my thing is very simple. Who's, who's signing my check? It's that simple. You will always be faced with conflicts no matter what you do, how you do it, how well you do it. How badly you do it. I hate to say this, but we live in a country where mediocrity is celebrated, which is why nothing ever goes better. It's like I remember I, I spent two hours with one music director who I won't name explaining loudness, dynamics on YouTube. This will happen, that will happen, it will get crushed. He says, Yeah, man, we must keep the dynamics. But before going, he patted me on the shoulder. But man, keep it slamming loud. <laughs> <laughs> now, you have reason and we have our filmy ways. Yeah, there, there's this deep-seated, deep seated, even in commercials, there's this deep-seated fear for so many years that, man, my commercial doesn't sound as loud as the one before it. Or my commercial doesn't sound as loud as the one after it. Suddenly that guy's one comes on and it's slamming, you know, why can't we get this sound? Yeah, maybe because you got a commercial with an old auntie making chai in the kitchen and that one has one James Bond car chase. It's not going to be the same volume level. But that's how it is in real life. Everything you do today as engineers and producers is creative. Creativity is subject to criticism at every level. Yeah? And it can be a variety of reasons. Client may have had a fight with his wife in the morning and come to listen to the song and is in a shitty mood and picks apart your perfect mix. I don't like the snare. What is this bass? What did you do? Anything can happen for any reason. You have to accept it. Make your point as far as you can. But ultimately, who signs the check? That's the rule. Who signs the check? You can stand on your principles or you can take a step back and just Refuse to make money doing shitty work. I've done that. I mean, you must have noticed that so many of you are here to hear me talk, but I've hardly got any new mixes out there because I've taken a step back and I refuse to do just shit for money. Any questions? It's a delicate job. Engineering is 10% work and probably 90% politics. I have a yeah. question, and this is regarding the so-called loudness war that goes on. Uh, you know, back in the day, like, we used to listen to albums. So, you know, when you listen to an album, for example, you get used to the dynamic range of that album from the first second till the last minute of the hour, you know. Nowadays, music is, you know, it's a multi-genre playlist, right? So people listen to, let's say, EDM followed by a funk track, right? Now, obviously, because of the dynamics involved within the genre, the 
the loudness of the master who will make a difference, right? You will be Where are you listening to? On, on studio monitors or high quality headphones, for example. Yeah. Right. But what is your source? Is it your source? Is it from MP3? No, no, is it from no, your I'm, iTunes? I'm talking primarily iTunes and streaming platforms. No, no, but again, mm -hmm. have you ripped the CD yourself? Have you bought a CD and ripped it? Is it playing from Apple Music? Uh, no, so so when, when I talk about CD, like full on albums, these are CDs I've bought and I've been listening to it on a CD okay. player. But I'm talking about the trend that since everything is online, right, these days, and everything is anyway squashed because of the format being MP3, right? How do you draw the line between one, the fact that you have to compete with the loudness war, right? And yet retain the dynamics of the track so that, you know, it, it communicates well sonically. How do, you, how do you draw that line? And especially, for example, if, if I send out a master uh, track, right, to somebody and the, the client says, hey, it's not loud enough, it's not as loud as, let's say, a chill focus track, you know? So how do you go about dealing with that scenario where the client is ask, asking you to push it up in terms of loudness, but as an engineer, you are inclined towards retaining dynamics? You prove it to him. So you have to fight for it, basically. Well, like I said, barring the story of the unnamed music music director who said, well, slam it. Right. Yeah. Today, there are many things you can do. There's, uh, if you follow productionexpert.com, okay, there's a lovely new online thing that will check your loudness levels and tell you how loud it would be for Spotify, Pandora, or Apple Music, or so whatever. you have to Yes. So you don't don't even need to have a fancy meter or plug. Secondly, you can do three versions of the mix. Put it up on YouTube as a private link, and ask the guy to hear it and tell, say, tell me which version you like best. Chances are he will choose the more dynamic one because the louder one will just get squashed down. So when you actually hear it on YouTube, it's not going to sound louder the way it does in the studio. Yeah, because YouTube's algorithm is limited to minus 14 or minus 12 or whatever the figure they use. Yeah, so sometimes you have to take the horse to the water and jam its head inside and make it drink. If it's still not going to drink, then there's, there's nothing you can do. See, ultimately, artists, whether you're talking about them in terms of being the producer of the film or album or the producer of the song, or the music director of the song. Yeah, each cumulative process is destroying their creation when it is wrong. Yeah, every study shows that we listen to music dynamically. I believe part of this problem is that there's a whole generation who listens to music now on headphones, which is not great in itself. Secondly, you listen to everything at full volume, your iPhone or whatever your phone you are playing it on or iPod. I don't know if people even use iPods anymore. But uh, it's at full volume. So there's no dynamic range. Very few people actually now bother to have a music system at home. Everything is, in, uh, yeah, I bought this blue Bluetooth beatbox and my whole family can play from the iPad and phone. That's great, but I think people have forgotten how good a cracking good music. I mean, it doesn't even have to be an expensive music system. <coughs> even just a separate amp or a pair of good active speakers connected to a CD player. Hear it. I mean, you'll be amazed how good it sounds if you've been only listening to MP3s for the last year. Everything will just come alive. And the way we are consuming music today is what is spoiling it all. I have gone back. I, I have... I have Apple Music, I have Amazon Music subscription, I have an Alexa, I have a Google Home, I have a, a, the Apple, what's it called? And yet about three weeks back, my son has started listening to Led Zepp and I bought a whole box of CDs, Led Zepp CDs, saying at some point I won't be able to find these anymore. So I bought them three years back, they were still CDs. So I said let's listen to it properly. I pulled down the CD player from my attic, plugged it in and I mean, like, it, it, like, my son's 11 years old, he's not a music expert, but even for him, it was like, wow, is that how it sounds? Is this how immigrant sound sounds? So, I think, I think all of you, as practitioners of the art, whether you're producing, or whether you're mixing, or you're creating music, you owe it to yourselves to see 
live concerts listen to music well at home music for relaxation music you love music you grown up with make the effort track down the cd get even a half as today 3000 rupee blu ray player will still play music from a cd better than any mp3 player you're going to find listen to music again because unless you have a memory of music you listen to that way you're going to mix that way i think if you if you if you buy anything today any any piece of equipment hardware from rupert nee it has the same what i'm saying to you something like that written in the back of the manual download any rupert nee manual and <coughs> there's a paragraph written by him on the memory of the music memory of music where he says the same thing that you are constantly building up a mental bank a mental picture for yourself of how music should sound like if you're not exposed enough to great sounding music and i'll digress a little here but i have a music collection of 4000 cds i might listen love to listen to maybe 600 or 800 of them the rest of it is not necessarily be music i love or enjoy or something i come home and say i want to play this but it is music i'm studying yeah because things have evolved in a different way in terms of production where it's going where it's come from different genres of music yeah i mean at my age today i if i want to play music i'll play like the highest rates of pink floyd or old stuff i don't want to hear whatever the new stuff is but i do hear the new stuff because my son plays it my wife plays it and i'm aware of what it is like and i make an effort to try and find the cd which is getting more and more difficult today in india i don't buy music on apple music because i refuse to pay cd money for mp3 quality so i would rather still today buy the cd rip it at full wave put it on my terabyte server and listen to it then pay for an mp3 even if i never play the cd again <laughs> i'm old fashioned i still like having the thing in the artwork and the full credits of who did what where it was recorded etc any questions further Sir, uh, can you evaluate on mixing in the head and then recreating it on the desk? Can I or can you? Can one or can we? Can you evaluate more on mixing in your head first and then recreating? It? I'll tell you something. We are all always mixing in the head. If you aren't, then you are not doing your job properly. or you are not made to do this job it's being forced upon you or somebody is telling you oh, wow there's lots of money in media and it's very cool and it's of like going and working hard at a university mom and dad will spend money send you to australia to sa enjoy for 3 years come back and you'll be an engineer no it's a fact i have noted that a great number of people young people choose to be engineers just because it's a lark man it's a great thing your parents are willing to spend the money you have the money go and live 3 years in la or 3 years in chicago 3 years in sa melbourne or, i mean travel travel and opportunity to meet people is in itself a great education so and it's it's an easy education it's not like doing your ms or phd or anything but if you're not mixing continuously in your head whilst working not and you are not working then you have to be little musically inclined to do this job of course if you are sitting at your dining table having dinner and thinking whether you should have put 2 db more on the snare then you are oc <laughs> <laughs> anything else yeah someone raise their hand there no you want him to ask a question for you <laughs> The more questions there are, there are no stupid questions. Exactly. That's what I was about to say. Don't think that I, uh, if I ask this question, I will look like an idiot. But any all, all questions are valid. We were all beginners once. The only thing I was ever taught was how to use a gate on a compressor. The first recording I ever did was direct to a DAT machine which had no monitoring. I gated the shit out of the voiceover, thinking I was being really cool. And then when we played it back after, luckily it was Pratap Sharma and. just lived five buildings away so he came back to do it the next day but next day 
my recording was just uh, 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 like that. <laughs> Everyone learns from their mistakes. I've never used the gate after that. <laughs> you have a superb engineer standing in front of you. Any question? You can start from the difference between expander and gate also. I don't have all the answers. I believe that engineering is a lot like being a doctor. If you stop learning, you will stop being relevant. Your learning can only push you so far. We've seen this happen in history again and again and again. A whole generation of really superb, what we used to call recordists. Yeah? And when newer systems came out, these people refused to learn. They refused to learn Pro Tools. They refused to use a computer. They refused a uh, 2 inch 24 track and give me my SSL. Great, I mean, that's wonderful. But they lost, in my opinion, 15, 20 good years of work because they didn't evolve. <coughs> and the same thing will keep happening. Today, Pro Tools is there. Tomorrow, it could be something else. It could be one holographic cube which just records terabytes of information. You never know where it's going to go. But if you want to continue doing work or you enjoy doing the work, then you have to keep growing with the thing. Everyone makes it out to be like, I know everything. I know nothing. I'm sure there's shitloads I can still learn. And more often than not, when this happens, when people retire, because they didn't keep up with the time, a whole lot of learning dies with them. We'll never know how they used to use mics. We'll never know how they recorded 80 people on a four-channel thing with 16 mics going into it. If you and I were put into a room today with four mics and asked to record 60 people and make everything sound clear like those people did, maybe they don't know computers and Pro Tools. Yeah, but there's a great learning there. There's phasing between mics, how they handle that, how everyone sang and played together in time. That learning has been lost. Today, I find most people don't understand miking when recording, just basic recording. Everyone has a lot of fancy mics. Everyone wants to try out that man. I've got the new Neumann, I've got the new AKG. And he'll buy a T-bar and he'll mic it in stereo. Or he'll bloom line it and he'll XY it and then he'll decode it and he'll MS the mics and all. But you don't understand basic miking with an SM57. And sometimes it's laziness. Put the guy in front of the mic and record. I've seen engineers who press record and take without getting a level distance, timber, tone, anything. So, when you don't keep up as a generation with technology, yeah, everything that you've learned till there will die with you because it will not be passed on to the next person who is working under you at a transition level. And that's, that's why this lecture is happening today because I've always firmly believed in sharing knowledge. A lot of engineers are scared that if I show them my secret EQ, or I show them my secret compressor technique, then they will be able to do like me and they will make the money. That's a very stupid and pointless view. So that means tomorrow, if that engineer dies, whatever he's learned has died with him. It's not passed on to anyone else. You guys comfortable there? Want to like come inside this side? So like everyone's like crammed near the door. <laughs> My name is Josh. I'm 17 years old right now. My question to you is, um, what do you see coming in the industry, the new technology that's coming in the industry? What do you see in the next 10 years that will change significantly uh, the process of what's happening right now? I'll be older. <laughs> that's all I know. And probably Pro Tools 2028.1.6 will be out. So. You can't tell. Uh, anything can happen. Any industry undergoes change that is driven by the people who drive it. Today, the industry is driven by artists. At the base level, everything is driven by money. Remember that. So, but to answer your question a little more seriously and not too much in depth, I think everything is going to be digital. In my opinion, very honestly, analog is now just fashionable. And I'll tell you why it is just fashionable. About maybe like six years ago, there were plugins that were reasonably accurate, yeah? But you could run maybe one instance 
of the plugin and your computer would show 60% or 80% usage CPU using. The only thing ultimately that is stopping software from overtaking hardware is computational power. Yeah, I mean you as producers who have been working for a long time, if you've been working for 50, I don't know if anyone has been working for 15, 20 years, but at one time when you had a sample library, you had a single snare hit. I still have sample libraries by Bob Clear Mountain that have single snare and kick hits. Today in contact, you have the same same snare sample, individually sampled at 85 different velocities. And then you multiply that by hit in different places on the snare surface. How is that possible? It's just because today you can access that kind of memory immediately at high speed. So you can have that many samples being able to be triggered immediately and because you have the computational power to make it happen. In the old days, we had like 4 MB or 8 MB was like full sampler memory. So you could only load one hit, one open hi-hat, one close hi-hat, one symbol. The decay of the symbol couldn't be more than two and a half seconds because the sampler couldn't handle it. So as technology marches on, it is an inevitable thing. All of you today I think analog is awesome and yes it is but I think plugins are awesomer and I'm sure you're surprised to hear me say that I have a lot of analog gear yeah I've been steadily reducing the amount of analog gear I have over the years because of a couple of reasons one is analog recall is really painful hmm. I don't know how many it's wonderful to have analog if you are a tracking engineer. You put it, set it, forget it, move on. But if you are a mixing engineer, it's a nightmare. Yeah, for me, a typical thing means it takes me about an hour and a half to make a change between songs. And that's an hour and a half of my life and the person waiting's life, they will never get back. For me, when I mix, usually, Everyone says, oh, well, I want to run all through all, all this analog gear you have. Yeah, cool, yeah, wonderful, this is great. And I will tell them the same thing, that we will mix one song, we will finalize the song, we will dump stems, we will dump mixes with volume, singing up, singing down, guitar up, guitar down, and then that's it. I will reset and we will go on to the next song. And yeah man, 100% I'll be on. You tell me when you finish the first song, Rough Mix, I'll be there for the automation and everything. Nothing happens. Nobody has the effing time. It's that simple. So what happens is that one song with its non-stop changes stays on analog. I, I, I know my normal process would be I take photos of it. I load the photos from my iPhone, make sure it's backed up in iPhoto, drag it to the desktop, label the photos, what song it is, what part it is going to put all those into the Pro Tools session, <coughs> save the Pro Tools session, make sure there's a backup of that session. And then the guy said, listen, can we put 2 dB more of that 10K on the snare? Everything I've done has to be done again. Mm -hmm. Whereas if you are working with plugins in the box, sure, sure, okay, <laughs> tap it. Offline. One minute later, you have your results. I don't, I have started keeping only analog gear that I feel is not replicable yet. But to answer your question again, it is inevitable that it will be. Today, if some of you use UAD cards, for example, you will know that a basic UAD card can run only one or two instances of, say, the manly massive passive. There's a reason for that. It's taking massive computational power. But if at some point they have a 28 core UAD card, yeah, you can be sure they will release a second version of it which uses 8 cores and that will be far more accurate than the one that used up 2 cores. So you will be that much closer. It's already close. When I finally mix an album the same way where that one analog song is lying across all the outboard gear for months and I get fed up. I mix the rest of the songs in the box. But at the end of the day, when the album comes out, nobody says, hey, that's the analog song. 
this one had that big SSL compressor on it and, uh, you know, I can make out the vocals went through a full text. No, nobody does. I can't remember. Because that's how close it is. Going analog is just a personal choice. For me, it's faster. I prefer it. <coughs> but then too much choice is also a workflow killer. Which is the reason why I reduced the amount of analog gear I had. And the same thing happens with plugins too. That's also a dangerous thing because what happens is today with the number of sales and promos and free coupons and this is $300 but if you buy all three of them you can get it just tomorrow you can get it for $79 and you think fuck $79 man how are you ever going to get all these plugins $900 $79 you whip out your credit card and buy it till you start seeing the pattern that every weekend the same thing is there for sale for $79 and then one weekend in November on Black Friday, the same thing is for sale for $29 and you think, damn, I wasted the $59 because I haven't still used the bloody plugin. I just bought it because it was a good deal. So what happens then is you don't take time to learn to use the plugins you're buying because you're just going on buying it and buying it and buying it and buying it. How many delays can you have? How many compressors can you have? How many new EQs can you have? And then you start noticing that when you mix, when I mix, I will almost always grab the Avid stock plugins before anything else. Because it's a comfort factor, I don't have to think. I've been using it for so long. Maybe four or five years ago it was fashionable to say, no, no, Avid's plugins, uh, all they suck. But they don't. They're some of the best plugins you can get out there. And you get them free with your... And every year they make it better and better for you. Anything else? Any other question? So I have, uh, I have one <coughs> session. As I said from Agnipat, Devashiri Ganesha, it is more of heavy Indian percussions and all. And I have one session from a Marathi film which has got live horns and strings recorded at LA, drums recorded at LA, and it's uh, full on drum and bass track. So, option is we'll do both. <laughs> Okay, so I wanted to, since we have some time before lunch and we haven't got the session yet, I wanted to tell you some things about the session we are going today and what our aim is. Yeah? It is, of course, going to be physically impossible for us to finish mixing the song to in possibly any semblance of a finished mix, even a static mix, let's say, without automation. Yeah, but what I want to show you is concepts more than actual mix. At the end of the day, we may have a really shitty mix and you'll go home and hear the Agnipat CD and think, wow, why did we come for this lecture? <laughs> and why isn't Vijay Dayal giving it? But uh, Vijay Dayal also has to learn so many things from this session. So, so the th idea is, I, I'm, not, I'm not really going to be mixing as such. I'm going to be showing you a lot of what I do. Now, this is open to debate in terms of whether it works for you or it doesn't work for you. Yeah? All of you are going to be severely disappointed today. I'm telling you this before I mix. Because I think all of you have come here thinking that he's going to show us some secret plugins which he doesn't talk about on Facebook. <laughs> and that's where that sound comes from. Or... Uh, he has these secret techniques where he is parallel compressing or serial compression or something he is doing and then he is doing that and doing that and it's all in whatever, some, there's no big secret to anything I do. <coughs> there's only one word that describes, I am methodical about what I am doing, manically methodical and I'm going to go through some of that and I thought it was only fair that I do it live in front of you. So it is not rehearsed. You can see where I make mistakes and go back and correct them because that's what happens in real life. Yeah, you can see how I start, how I change, I may, how I organize my tracks. And the, I'll, I'll be talking you through the reasons why I do what I do, coming from where I come from. Now, some of it may work for you, some of it may not work for you. I want you to understand the concepts. I don't want 15 guys here 
going away nodding that now we know how he mixes and we are going to be able to if we got our hands on those agnipat tracks we are going to be able to exactly do the same thing or some of you writing down use this plugin on the bass that's the one to use <laughs> i was little conflicted before in the last week and we talked several times and i leave the choice to you all we had a long chat on try to decide whether i should try and get all my plugins because this is my mobile system it's actually designed more to ape my famous studio system so that i don't have to go to the studio from home to make 5 minute changes to something that has to go day before yesterday so it does not really represent all the stuff i have at sonic laundry at all so we were questioning whether you'd like me to mix it only stock plugins in the avid system or you show you plugins that i use otherwise and favorite plugins of mine secret ones <laughs> so what's your opinion stock actually it's not the plugins it's the manual it's the instrument yeah no it is the plugins there are, there are the <laughs> <laughs> but they are not secret and i'd be very happy to show them to you and very happy if you buy them i'm not getting any cut out of it <laughs> so i think i'll show you with stock plugins i generally tend to use stock plugins a lot but there are certain plugins that i use to get a certain sound that i like which is i think it's close to analog any other questions we we'll take some more questions before breaking for lunch and then start mixing of course okay so mix for tea i'm going to give you advice that i don't take myself when i start mixing i like mixing drums really loud i'm a guitar player everyone expects okay i'm a guitar collector who barely plays <laughs> but everyone expects me to push the guitars up in the mix because you know he plays guitar so he shit up but actually drums is my big love i mix drums really loud at the bass really loud till i feel it's grooving that's not the right way to do it actually but again there is no right or wrong way it's like drinking whiskey if you want to have it with fanta and that makes you happy <laughs> you're already doing it the right way <laughs> yeah so but ideally if you don't want your fatty learn to start monitoring softer it will make a big difference to how long you can mix and more importantly the decisions you are making while mixing will be good sometimes it also works the other way you stop mixing because you think it sounds like shit and then you hear it next morning and it doesn't sound like shit so it works both ways but the ear is difficult to fool unlike the eye and the ear gets tired when your eyes get tired you go to sleep but when your ears get tired they start bullshitting you yeah so basically monitor so monitor at a consistent level is try it it's very difficult to do again this is advice i don't take myself but it's very difficult to do see consciously see how many times you you touch the volume control that's a good thing and a bad thing as a listener it's something i would highly encourage people because if people did that there would be no need for limiting on mixes and in mastering i mean that that is the basic precept of the movement against loudness which is that if someone likes a song they will crank up the volume to whatever level they are comfortable with you don't have to choose to do it for them whereas if you compress the song and limit it to shit they will turn it down because it's not enjoyable no matter how how much a fan of heavy metal you are i bet you you can't hear death metal magnetic by metallica loud in a room continuously the whole album by the end of two songs i can't and i'm a fan i can't hear it. this is the only one asking questions all of you know everything else then please help him at the lunch time oh so yes yeah, uh, 
So I would like to know that <coughs> what you hear in it sounds different in lot of different rooms, right? So as engineers, they work in lot of different rooms as well. So I've always <coughs> seen people like talking like always you should work according to what you hear and not see what happens in the plugin. So when you work in different rooms, how do you make the decision like okay, so now in this room, if I do this, this can this will sound decent. Very simple. I don't work in different rooms. I work in only two rooms. I famous and my own. But if I had to work in different rooms, I guess the more you work in a room, the more you understand it. And it's the same it's the same with speakers. I mean today we are lucky to have a really fancy pair of Genelex out here which my friend Shiv sent over saying, Oh you're doing a demo, do it with proper speakers that you are used to. But I was I would have been happy to mix with anything, I mean for this demonstration, to mix with anything that they have provided me with out here. It's not about the speakers or the room or it's about what you're hearing. I have very different views on translation A and on referencing. I don't think referencing really works. I don't understand people who will mix a song and then reference it against some multi-billion dollar master <coughs> record that's you know been mastered by some top level engineer mixed by some guy with mountains of gear and time at his disposal. What does that make? Unless you're mixing the same song again. So I don't reference mixes. I don't reference loudness level. Every song is unique. Every song calls for its own set of parameters, which as a decision might be right or wrong on the engineer's part or the mastering engineer's part. So that's what I'm saying. This is a mind field. You are never going to make everyone happy. Yeah. The thing is, more than happiness is to be consistent in your approach to what you're doing. You will have arguments, you will have fallouts with people who don't agree with you. Again, that's something that you need to decide how far you want to push it. Fight for your rights, fight for your engineering or just get that check signed. That's precisely the reason why we don't have really any standards of quality in this country because the standards are imposed upon us. Even today in television, yeah, I've, I've had masters rejected which are too soft. The guy from the product, there's a production house that makes the online master, the masters that are sent to the TV station. He rejected my mixing, it's too soft. I got into a huge battle with Sony and finally I won because I said it's a creative call. How, you can tell me it's too loud. And if it's too loud, your inline limiter will clip it to whatever your broadcast normal uh, loudness normalization is set to. But you can't tell me it's too soft. It's a creative call. It's a nighttime scene. I want it that soft. The director of the commercial wants it that soft. The client doesn't have a problem or is not insecure that the next commercial is much louder than mine. So who are you to tell me? But do you know why it happens? It happens because now we have international television conglomerates in our arena. And those television conglomerates have loudness normalization worldwide. So you have a set of loudness normalization curves for say, National Geographic channel. Yeah. Now whatever National Geographic does is translated and the same thing is put into play here in India. Except no one here is educated as to why they are doing. They've just been sent a package and said please everyone install this TC electronic hardware, install these new gen audio plugins for loudness and it can't go over minus 14 dB LUFS. So you have engineers saying, no sir, it's minus 13.8 LKFS. I said, what is the difference between LKFS and LUFS? No, oh, I don't know. But we've been told on the plugin, it shouldn't show that. I said, is it absolute? Is it long term? Is it momentary? Is it over a sliding 10 second scale? No, sir, we don't. So we have the blind leading the blind. Somebody in America has said, this is our standard for loudness worldwide. Japan has been given the thing, England has been given the thing, America has been given the thing, Australia has been given the thing, India has been given the thing. <coughs> Except nobody has told the Indian engineers why there is lack of education and then people have fights about it. 
Same thing. I mean, I don't know how many of you remember the Digi Beta format, which is what we delivered our broadcast masters on. Well, anyway, Digi Beta used to have two analog channels and two digital channels. And because the analog channels would clip, when you were making a sound master, you pulled down the sound by 10 dB. Now, this was performed by rote, by generation of generation after generation of guys in machine rooms doing sound slaps in all the major studios. Till it reached a point where no one remembered why, but they still do it. Today, you're sending a digital master for online, say YouTube or, you know, viral marketing, and they will still turn it down 10 dB from absolute zero when it doesn't make any difference. We're supposed to deliver full scale for digital. So we do things by rote without understanding why we are doing them by rote. And I hope today, I hope, I'd be very happy if I'm wrong and all of you already know what I'm going to show you. And we leave at 6 o'clock and you say, ah, what a bloody waste of time that was. But same thing with Pro Tools. There are many reasons why the older engineers do what they do, even with the newer system. Some of them may not make sense to you, but there is a reason why it's done that way. Okay, so shall we take a break? Change the card.